Hello and welcome. On behalf of the Department of Art and Art History and the LeBand Art Gallery, I welcome you to Kaleido LA. I'm Karen Rapp and I'm hosting this artist lecture series from the Loyola Marymount campus in Los Angeles. I want to acknowledge that our beautiful campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. The Kaleido LA series, which is a key program of the College of Communications and Fine Art, has long promoted the idea that the arts play a critical role in the education and formation of our students. Today, however, is an unprecedented and transformative time, and it is our students whose voices are calling loudest for societal and academic change. Indeed, LMU's students are making efforts to proactively shape their own pedagogy to co-inform their education and formation. This fall, Kaleido LA has sought to meet the moment. In building this program, I have curatorially centered artists who identify as BIPOC, an acronym that stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. I have also included members of LGBTQ communities whose artwork and lived experiences foreground issues of social, economic, and racial justice. It has been my great privilege to include all eight artists who have shared their work with us over the course of the fall semester. I am very grateful to everyone who has helped make this web-based series a success. Thank you to the faculty and staff of the Art and Art History Department, especially Arturo Mejia, Sari Cho Dobson, Alegria Garcia, David Yi, and Damon Willick, and also for the support provided by Kate Shirley from the CFA Dean's Office and Keith Jones from ITS. Emma Pollan and Jose Camacho, who are both juniors at LMU, are integral members of this team, as well as Molly Corey, the LeBan's gallery manager. I truly value the community we have created via this ever-challenging Zoom platform. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can write questions or give your reactions throughout today's talk. Your question will either be answered during the presentation or at its conclusion. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be archived on YouTube with a link available on the Kaleido LA website. Today, I am delighted to welcome my friend and collaborator, Joel Garcia, to the Kaleido LA series. Joel is a Los Angeles-based artist, arts administrator, and cultural organizer of the Decolonial Initiative Task Force. He is of Huichol background. Huichol are indigenous people living in the central western region of Mexico. He studied illustration at Otis College of Art and Design and was mentored there by artist Paul Botello. He holds degrees in both photography and business management from East Los Angeles College. Howell has more than 20 years of experience working transnationally, focusing on community-centered strategies. His approach is rooted in indigenous-based forms of dialoguing and decision-making that are non-hierarchical and that uplift non-institutional expertise. Garcia uses art and organizing to raise awareness of issues facing underserved communities, inner city youth, and other targeted populations. Howell is also the co-founder of Metzli Projects, an indigenous-based arts and culture collaborative centering indigeneity, 
into the creative practice of Los Angeles by using arts-based strategies to advocate for and organize by highlighting issues impacting Native artists and youth. He previously served as co-director of Los Angeles's internationally acclaimed print studio, Self-Help Graphics and Art. In 2019, Hoel was a Los Angeles Fellow of Monument Lab, an independent public art and history studio based in Philadelphia, which cultivates and facilitates critical conversations around the past, present, and future of monuments around the world. Recently, Hoel has been interviewed by publications such as the Los Angeles Times and the New Yorker to speak about the culture shift that is spreading across our country and to share his perspectives on critical issues related to the need to reconsider the legacy and function of public monuments, including the imperative for their removal. I'm very, very excited to have Hoel join the LMU community today. And I invite you Hoel to turn on your camera to join me here at the virtual podium. And it's wonderful to see you Thank you so much for making the time today. I'm going to um, listen intently in the background and join you at the end of your presentation. Thank you, Karen. It's an honor to be here. Um, and like Karen mentioned, you know, we I consider Karen a collaborator. Um, and I'll touch on how we our, our paths intersect, but I want to start off by acknowledging that I'm here in East Los Angeles, a community a territory, a village known as Apachianga, um, ancestral homelands and current homelands for the Tongva community. Um, I want to, I guess that was a lot in the bio. I kind of forget that um, I have a business degree from ELAC. Um, so it's good to be reminded of that. Um, so it's kind of a lot, but what I want to do with this presentation or with, or with this dialogue is to kind of, you know, present this arc of my career, of why some of these issues are important to me, um, why they're important to my community. But most importantly, I think the approach to doing this type of work, um, I think that that process is what in this current moment, artists are um, reflecting on, organizations are trying to figure out, and even government is trying to, to um, you know, see what path they take forward to having these very difficult conversations that none of us know how to facilitate, um, but we're learning along the way. Um, let's see, I think I need sharing options. Okay, here we go. And if you um, have any questions along the way, please feel free to ask and I'll, I'll do my best to um, answer those as they're coming in and, you know, kind of um, the relevancy to what I'm presenting at the moment. So again, you know, I'm born and raised here in Los Angeles, have been doing this work creatively since, um, you know, I, since I was in high school. Um, and so this is a community I grew up in. Um, the Maravilla Housing Project in East LA, a community that is um, part of LA County, but not part of the city of Los Angeles. I think a lot of folks don't know that East LA is, is not within the boundaries of the cities. So that for us has like a different set of implications in regards to the resources that are provided for, for folks here. Um, so East Los Angeles, just, you know, um, west of East Los Angeles College where Karen and I eventually ended up meeting and, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I also wanted to highlight um, the level of police that are in this area. Again, in the middle, the little green um, point, that is where I grew up. And these are the police entities that exist 
um, around my community. And, you know, that little marker there that shows like half a mile away from the CHP um, kind of gives you a, 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 an understanding of like the, the proximity to how close these um, police entities are. So you have the California Highway Patrol, a state agency. You have the Monterey Park Police Department. Monterey Park um, is right next to East Los Angeles. So we also have to deal with, you know, with their policing because they do have jurisdiction around that area. Then at East LA College, there's the East LA County Sheriff's. Um, you know, they have a contract with with the sheriffs, which I think in this current moment is being reevaluated because of everything around um, the efforts to defund the police. Right across the street from where I grew up um, was the LA County Park Police. Then the East LA Sheriffs, which at one point was the most heavily armed police force in the entire world. And that was through up, you know, up through the 90s up until the 2000s. That was, you know, a, a um, something that, you know, that they carried. They were the most armed police or the heavily armed police force in the entire country or in, in, actually in the entire world. And then up towards Cal State LA, we have like two training sites for the, uh, for the sheriffs um, that also include the SWAT team, um, the gang enforcement, which we're seeing um, a lot of information or, or a lot of news around with these deputy gangs, which a lot of them res reside within the gang unit division of the sheriffs. So that's kind of the environment that I grew up in. The level of police around me, we went anywhere, we encountered police in mass. Um, and, you know, one of the things for me that was really important was, um, is really important still at this moment is a representation of, of my community and folks like me who, um, who grew up with the same realities that I did. And so in the late nineties, this book came out, East Side Stories and a couple others followed similar to that which for me really gave a um, really fetishized perception of what my community was. You know, this, this youth that's handcuffed to the chair, that's my friend David, who I grew up with. Um, at the moment, I think in this, in this photo, he might be like no older than 15 years old and he's high on heroin there. And I share this because I, I don't know what business anybody had showing um, or what consent they had around showing youth in, in these type of um, situations, right? The, the folks in the cover, you know, also youth. Um, these photos I believe were taken when I was in middle school, like 92, 93, although this book came out, um, I think 98. So these folks on the, you know, Right here that like, you know, there's a photo coming from like a police car. Those are like friends I grew up with. To this day, I interact with them, I see them. And on the right, this chart that you see with all these photos, they blocked out the faces. These were Polaroids that were at the station that when, you know, um, whenever we got taken in for, for just for being harassed and, and we're shown this chart of folks who were killed um, and, you know, the police, Made, it, made every effort to ensure that we saw this and they mocked us for this. Um, and at times we saw folks that we knew in this chart. Um, and again, like, you know, the representation of what folks understood East LA to be um, comes from a lot of this, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, fetishizing of, of poor folks. So on one side, you have these, these individuals leaning up against a car and they're portrayed in this book as being gang members, right? But in a sense, in the other photo, um, you know, and I made those arrows to indicate like the white van in both images and then the gentleman walking away, the same gentleman. Um, none of these were gang members. These were all parents, um, uncles, and you know, the, the youth in the other image, again, those are all folks I grew up with. Um, some have passed, um, you know, and, that is the reality that I grew up with. This image um, I wanted to show because this is also what was happening in my community. Coming together through sports and activities, this mural in, in the background was painted in 93. And this is where, for me, I would say like my artistic career begins. I met Paul Botello at the projects and 
um, you know, he was looking for somebody to help him paint. And one of my friends in the previous photo, the one with his like um, hand in his mouth, like with the Nike shorts, he ran to my house, one of go call me and said, um, someone's looking for you. They're looking for somebody that knows how to do art. So I went, met Paul Botello and my journey as a public artist um, or, some, or, or an artist who was involved in public art begins. And with Paul, um, you know, I spent many years helping him paint different murals across um, the city of Los Angeles. Uh, and through his, you know, through working with him, um, you know, as any youth in, in, in the community that I grew up in, um, we're gonna face struggles being in school. I was kicked out, suspended, um, but I managed to graduate and through the support of folks like Paul and Ruben Guevara, who is the one who managed um, this program, I was able to join Otis. While I, while I was at Otis during my first year, I was shot. So I wasn't able to return. I consider it one of the best things that's happened in my life. And I share that because what it pushed me to do was reconsider what art can do. And I was involved in, in, you know, in the punk rock scene growing up and I was doing flyers and t-shirts for friends and their bands. And when I couldn't return to Otis, I forced myself to learn Illustrator and Photoshop. And then, you know, this whole other journey begins for me. There I learned this important um, idea of nurturing artistic or creative energy in individuals. I had, you know, I, you know, I had experienced a little bit of that with Paul and the way he approached his mentorship of me, of not giving me like, you know, you're gonna become an artist by doing A, you know, A through Z, but in order to be a successful artist, in order to be an artist that is fully supported, you need the folks around you to be able to um, provide you with the resources that you need, whatever they may be. So when I started doing these album covers, um, primarily for Epitaph Records in, in, on Sunset Boulevard over in, in, in Hollywood, many of these folks were, many of the bands there were bands that I was listening to, bands that I looked up to. And one of the, one of the primary approaches to the work that they were doing there, um, and Brett Gurowitz, and I, 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 I mentioned his name because that's somebody who I learned a lot from, indirectly and directly, uh, because the approach that he took to nurturing some of the bands that he that that were signed to his label was to look at every individual, every artist as this ecosystem of creative energy, and feed that ecosystem that ecosystem with with whatever it is that they might need, financial literacy, um, therapy, um, just every single element that any artist now that we, we understand, you know, artists to be like small businesses, um, you know, so he looked at every band in that, in that sense, that if their ecosystem was healthy and they had everything they needed around them, that no matter what they did, they were gonna be successful, whether they were successful as um, a band or if those band members went off and became music lawyers or um, you know, we're doing music licensing, they were gonna be successful in music period. And that's been you know, pretty emblematic of the type of work that they do. And so then later on, you know, I started doing work beyond just the punk rock scene and, and was fortunate enough to work with bands like Chicano Batman, The Black Keys, Las Cafeteras, bands who at this point are, you know, are pretty well known. You know, Chicano Batman and The Black Keys have been at um, Coachella. So really high profile artists. And so I took this work and alongside my organizing, committed myself to doing my artistic production under, I call them value systems. And I'll, and I'll share, I'll, go, I'll get into this a little bit. Um, so I do my work because of like the experience with having my community fetishized and misrepresented in many different ways. Um, I engage in this, in this approach um, because I want to do my community right, but I also want to create space for other folks like myself, other young artists to be able to step in and be their whole selves while being, um, while being a creative artist. So reciprocity, 
kinship, you know, re-indigenizing spaces, you know, revitalizing some of our traditions, reclaiming some of our traditions, sovereignty, like respecting the tribal sovereignty of, of indigenous communities here um, and non-hierarchical. What does it mean to do that type of work when you um, aren't trying to be the leader, you aren't trying to be the central focus to, to what's happening? Um, and then as far as artistic values, like authentic representation, just as I mentioned, um, consent, what are these ideas around consent when we portray our communities, when we portray other people's communities, what relationship do we have to those communities? What is our accountability to that relationship? And then authorship, who gets to tell that, to, to tell our stories, to tell your, your stories, and then, you know, being culturally competent, just because I identify as a, an indigenous person, doesn't mean that I get to speak for all indigenous people. So those things are like really important to how I've done my work, to how I do my work and how I've done my work. And, you know, these are some definitions around it. Reciprocity is, you know, at the end of the day is like, what are you contributing to your community, to a community as much as you're benefiting from it? Kinship, what, you know, we um, indigenous people call each other family members, right? We have aunties and we have uncles and, and all these grandmas and, and all these cousins. And they're not meant in a literal sense where we're blood related, but these are communities and families that we create, you know, self-selected families. So we have also a set of accountabilities and commitments to that and to nurturing those relationships. And re-indigenizing, right? How do we take out some of these colonial constructs that we're forced to engage in and infuse them with some of our own cultural practices, decision making, for example, you know, and then sovereignty. Again, I'm an indigenous person here living on the lands of the Tongva, Chumaj, Tataviam um, communities. I have to engage in this reality as an ind as an indigenous person, um, knowing that I can sometimes also benefit from settler privilege. There are more folks who identify as Chicano, Mexican American, um, that I also are part of that community, the Chicano community. And in sheer numbers, there's just more of us that we can overwhelm sometimes the, um, the efforts of folks here whose this is our ancestral homelands to either reclaim territory, um, initiate certain policies. So understanding this for me is also critical to not overstepping my bounds as, a, um, as an indigenous person living in LA. And then, you know, talked about, you know, doing this work in a non-hierarchical fashion. What does that mean, right? Decentralized um, processes in which not one individual holds power, not one individual makes decision-making. Um, much of it in an effort to avoid having tensions that result in conflict, consensus-based, right? And, but most importantly, also acknowledging multiple forms of knowledge, not just um, knowledge that is is validated by um, institutional degrees. Um, together, these things I call art space healing practices. At the end of the day, we do work, or I do work, that creates opportunities for folks to um, process their lived experiences, um, engage in in activities that might begin a healing process for them. So many of, many of the folks that I do this work alongside take this approach as um, you know, healing trauma as a, the primary goal to creating art, to um, community projects. And you know, that is something that is critically important to me. And um, you know, I break these out in these three different forms because I think it's been easy for folks to um, be able to latch onto some of these ideas in a form that is more representative of what their, their own lived reality, right? So land acknowledgement. You heard Karen, you know, acknowledge that these being the ancestral homelands of the Tongva community. So whose land do I live on? Um, how does my practice positively or negatively impact the indigenous peoples of Los Angeles? And how can I center the Tongva and Tatavium within my work? And then indigenous based conflict resolution around, there's a lot of conversations going around and alternatives to policing, right? Um, we've heard a lot about transformative justice, restorative practices, and many of these forms come from indigenous-based indigenous ceremonies that are rooted in conflict resolution. 
So as a, as a male, I benefit from certain privileges. I know that. So how does me creating art either wield that as a weapon or um, walk with a certain responsibility uh, with that privilege to create space for folks to um, uplift others? Um, and so how does that work in itself um, spark healing and reconciliation? And then stewardship, you know, do I know enough about where I live, who lives, who's, who is a Tongva community, who am I engaging with, um, you know, not just making relationships with one person, but with the community as a whole. Um, and then what can I do as an artist to support those efforts, whether they revolve around environmental justice or like in this, in this conversation, um, monuments, memory, and public space. So I, I you know, um, I reached out to Karen back in, I believe, 2015 with an idea of, of work that I wanted to um, be able to present to folks. And like I mentioned, I grew up in the projects. I was in, uh, you know, involved with gangs and I myself created and experienced a lot of harm. And folks like myself, this is a portrait of Fabian Devora who came out of Homeboy Industries, lives in Boyle Heights. Um, and I wanted to give a different representation of what communi my community is and was. And that just because some of us grew up and experienced, you know, uh, you know, a decade of, of, you know, the 90s is called a decade of death. Um, some really, um, you know, traumatic moments doesn't mean that because of that we're broken people or that we're any less than anybody else. And so my goal was to pay homage to individuals like Fabian, who now uses that experience and art to help others transform their lives, you know, for, you know, for the sake of healing and wellness. Fabian now is, um, has started his own organization, Somos Larte LA, in partnership with Homeboy Industries, and is working with the reentry program of, of LA County to help folks coming out of incarceration, um, come back into the community and use art as a way of being able to do that. Raul Garcia, another friend of mine, same, you know, same experience, you know, grew up, um, had issues with, with um, substance abuse, incarcerated, uh, and has used his journey with, with healing himself and dealing with some of this stuff to heal others through ceremony, but also through mental health support. He's a, he's a, he's a current employee of LA County Department of Mental Health. Um, and this is the work that we do on a daily basis, whether it is through art or dialogue. Um, so I wanted to pay homage to these individuals and through the support of Karen and at that time, the Vincent Price Art Museum, I was able to present this work um, as a solo exhibition, bring in folks, present some ideas around um, some of what you heard, kinship, relationship building. Um, what does it mean for us to heal some of these, these traumas that, that we've grown up with? And so these are some photos from the exhibition. I present my work, or I like to present my work alongside, um, I guess for lack of a better term, exhibitions, uh, I mean, installations. Uh, so, you know, there's these there was these opportunities for folks to engage. In the previous photo, um, you see an individual making a tobacco tie, a prayer tie. Um, and this is a traditional art form, a traditional prayer form that comes from, you know, the Lakota um, and Dakota people, but has been used amongst indigenous folks across the country because some of these teachings have been used to address issues of sobriety. So here in California, um, Lakota teachings were primarily used in prison to help folks uh, walk away from drugs and alcohol abuse. And these are some of the, you know, this is an installation from the exhibition. And then you'll see the Ojo de Dios behind me. This is a detailed shot of it. That is very, very emblematic of traditional um, art. And, you know, when, you know, one of the uses, for example, is when a children is born, um, the parents make this as a prayer offering. So again, tying in this idea of setting intentions and prayer and how we're all kind of interwoven with one another. Um, folks that make these typically use yarn, but I used um, shoelaces to kind of just tie back into 
um, what I grew up with, right? The hip hop music, you know, the hip hop scene and the punk rock scene here in, in, in Los Angeles. So for me, it was just a little bit of my remixing of, of that art form as well. And, you know, I carried on this, this idea of paying homage to, to men in my, in my life who've, who've come from harm and have used that to better their lives and that of others. So this is a portrait of my grandfather who, um, whose father was um, killed by, by firing squad in, in Jalisco during the Cristero Wars. Um, and, you know, his family fled that town ended up in Guadalajara. Um, and that's how I come to be here in Los Angeles. And I'm gonna pause for a minute to, you know, just to check on the question um, around therapies uh, or therapy. Um, it's just a comment, so. Um, but yeah, feel free to share it, you know, ask any questions as I present. Um, and let me get back to let me go back to my PowerPoint. So I came at one point to um, work at South Hall Graphics. South Hall Graphics was a organization that was down the street from where I grew up in, and when. I began working there, these different parts of me, I think, came together. All through this whole time of, of, of what I've shared with you about growing up in, in East LA, I also was doing community organizing, organizing that was alongside the Zapatistas down in Chiapas, um, other indigenous communities um, here in Southern California, but in Mexico as well. I also, around that same time, working with musicians, I began booking um, tours across um, Latin America and even into Europe. So I learned a great deal of different things. And at South Hall Graphics, I was able to bring all those things together. And you know, the history of South Hall Graphics is rooted in social justice. It came out of the East LA walkouts and was further, you know, further um, cemented as being an important entity during the Chicano moratorium and how they helped artists, um, you know, artistically create a voice for, for, for folks here in East LA, but also the Chicano community nationwide. I felt a certain responsibility to that legacy, not only because it was my community, this is where I grew up in, um, but because it was very, you know, very much in line with my values as a, um, as a cultural organizer, as an activist at times, and as an artist period. Um, and so while there, we used our, um, these are you know, programs that I developed as a way of engaging in social issues. And so one of the, you know, one of the things I think that gave me the most joy around this time was that as, as Trump was trying to defund the NEA, we were able to, and we applied to this, you know, we applied for this grant previous to his, his, um, to his election. But the way grants go, sometimes they can take a year before you're, um, you know whether you're awarded the grant or not. So we applied before he was um, elected. As he came in, he tried to defund the NEA. And it turns out that we got this grant to work with day laborers and street vendors. Folks who, you know, um, we're seeing right now are, are like, highly susceptible to, um, you know, being displaced, um, you know, the effects of COVID, you know, like, because they have no health care. And because these were federal funds, we knew, or I knew off the bat that we couldn't pay these, these individuals to participate in these programs. We couldn't give them stipends, but we wanted to support in one way or another. So what we developed was, you know, we, we the grant in itself was to create or turn self help graphics into like a design house for street vendors and day laborers. And folks came in, um, you know, I knew for sure that these, these small businesses had, um, you know, their own vision of what their, what their um, enterprise is. So I'm sure they had logos in mind 
And we brought them in, they developed their own logos, we taught them how to screen print. And we, or I, the idea was that if, you know, a landscaper was out there dressed in his own uniform for like a better term that they designed, it's less likely that they'd be harassed by the police. And, you know, this is kind of where, for me, I think I stopped being just a visual artist and engage more in, in you know, larger impact creative action. And so in 2018, um, in partnership with the Trans Latina Community Coalition, we designed this creative action at the World Series um, during game five, I believe. And I'll show you a quick video. So I'll go back to this photo for right now. Um, you know, for some folks, the question might be like, what is, or how does art translate into um, an action of this type? I'm very much of, of, the, of the idea that um, as an artist, you can also orchestrate a moment and design the environment for things to happen. And I'll come back, I'm gonna go through these slides really quick. So this is a Columbus removal in November of 2018. Um, this is once I was removed, again, creating and making space for multiple voices to be heard. This is a youth from Semillas, a school out in El Sereno that is, um, approaches education through an indigenous perspective. Here is Columbus being carted off. Um, and these are some, you know, kind of touching on like these best practices or groundings around doing this type of work or how we can use these actions to create dialogue and make space for these difficult conversations. Um, and again, about just as much as possible, including as many people in the process, giving them the agency and the opportunity to, you know, to lead and what that creates, right? This, again, this is at the Sarah removal statute, but this I would say was a moment that was designed um, and, um, and that, I mean, to me, that's a create that that's creativity, that's being artistic. Um, that is imagining and envisioning what a moment can be like, but with the understanding that at the end of the day, there's there's a message that you want to convey to folks and an opportunity for dialogue that needs to be created. Um, so designing the moment, uh, and I'll show you this one video. Hello, it's like two minutes. This is just the beginning of healing that needs to occur amongst our people. This is a man who has created genetic trauma for myself amongst our ancestors. These ancestors of ours, they struggled loving themselves because somebody like this told them that they were disgusting, told them that they were, they were useless other than for sex and for slavery. And because of somebody like that, we struggle today as a community. These statues and monuments which have been erected all over our sacred unceded land are constant reminders of the dominant society on their need to celebrate the wrongs of the past. We cannot teach love and compassion to our youth when they receive a completely different narrative in school and outside of tribal communities. It is time to teach the truth and remove the lies and depression. It is time to remove the commemorations of hate bigotry and colonization. So a lot has happened since then, you know, there's been a lot of different dialogues created around 
um, the different perspectives to removing monuments, this idea of collective memory, memory culture, um, you know, covered by the LA Times, the New Yorker, um, and just publications nationally, but it's an international conversation. I was also part of a group of folks um, who in partnership with the Goethe Institute, um, a German agency and the German Office for Civic Education around this project called Shaping the Past. Um, and it involves folks in Canada, Mexico, um, um, even down to, I think, um, South America, there's cohorts from South America. And so a bunch of different conversations and different um, approaches to how we have these dialogues around, you know, the monuments that we live alongside and what they mean and how they impact people of color, people like myself. So the, for me, there is a di direct connection between this built environment and how um, communities like mine, folks like me have experienced harm on behalf of the police state um, and the impacts of colonization. Um, but I also wanna give a big shout out to the photographers who have supported this work, who are very much present. Um, this is the Sarah statue that was removed the day after or the week after the Sarah statue at Olvera was removed. This was removed by the city. Um, the day before we held a, um, a vigil there um, and folks thought that, you know, it was also going to be toppled. The intention for that day was just to hold the vigil and to support the Tataviam in their efforts to remove this, to have the statue removed, which they success successfully pushed the city to, to have it taken down. This is a Rivera um, during the 4th of July or the 4th of July where another statue, this one of the King of Spain was wrapped up um, and you know hidden from public view for that day. And you can see a bunch of community members in the center there in front of the statue is a family of Tongo Chumash descent um, who led a ceremony um, reclaiming the space. Um, and, you know, again, just kind of reclaiming space through simple acts of, of, of creativity. These were prayer ties that were, that were tied during the fall um, equinox. The Sarah statue was removed during the summer solstice. Um, that was very intentional as well. The date and time, same as this. So this idea of bringing, you know, how we're connected to celestial bodies, to the earth, um, and using that as part of how we do some of this work. This is at Grand Park. Um, in this pole back here is where the, the Columbus statue was at. Now it's, that it's removed, um, there's been two projects that have been supported by the LA County Department of Arts and Culture, a program that I helped design called Futurity and Memory in Yangna, where um, a installation by our Tongva artist Mercedes Dorame was installed. It's currently there now up until July 4th. So you can go check it out at Grand Park. And also like a virtual reality project by Cindy Alvitre, who is a Tongva elder, um, is part of the Tiat Society. Um, I can share links with that. I'm happy to share this presentation afterwards for anybody who um, who attended, and I'll include uh, you know all these different links. But now you know, in a sense, that that space at Grand Park um, is also being used now by um, the Tongva community in a more intentional way. So these are, you know, for us, by removing these monuments, um, we open up these opportunities to talk about the authentic history of Los Angeles, um, what that means to reconcile with, with, with understanding that we live on the backs of indigenous folks of any territory and how we can help in bridging um, healing, but also being stewards of these conversations, not being shy to have them, not be, um, you know, it is, these are difficult conversations that are taking place worldwide. And the more we have them, the better off we're gonna be. Um, and I go back to this map because this map here, like I said, I was gonna share like this arc with you all. These are killings by the sheriffs um, in East Los Angeles, beginning in 2015 up into today. We did a series of altars during Day of the Dead um, this past year. Um, and it was 21 total altars for 24 people who've been killed by the police just here in East Los Angeles in my community. 
um, over the span of five years. And here, a couple weeks prior, um, on October 22nd, in partnership with the um, folks um, in an organization called um, United for Stolen Lives, which comes out of the October 22nd coalition, um, an organization that was doing anti-police brutality work you know, from the early 90s and on, there was over 700 candles placed in front of City Hall commemorating every individual who's been killed by the police um, since I believe 2012. And I'll stop at this slide. And so, you know, that is um, the reality that I grew up when heavily informs how I do my work as a indigenous person but also as somebody who walks with male privilege, I'm a, you know, I'm a straight male and um, that has big implications as to how I move about this world. And it's important for me to reconcile with that. Um, but I think you know, the, the biggest thing for me is, is being able to use art to initiate these conversations, not to have my point of view be the central focus of it, but to create, you know, this like third space that we can come in, have difficult conversations. Um, I was recently in a conversation with um, Father Tom Elowat from Ventura, from the mission there. Um, a couple of folks from the Los Angeles Task Force for Civic Memory and Monuments, which includes Christopher Hawthorne, um, and then some tribal elders from the Gabrielino um, Quiche Nation from the Tataviam and from the Chumash community. And every single one of us, oh, and then um, Professor UC, from UCR, Steve Hackle, who's written a lot about Sarah and his contributions to, to California. And as difficult as these conversations were, I, mean, I think we had a very healthy, fruitful conversation and, you know, folks are gonna be on opposite ends of what Sarah has meant to California, um, good and bad. And the way I approached this conversation with them was this idea that Sarah has been developed into a brand, into this catch all for everything that the mission system did in California, whether folks um, see that as something good or something bad, but he's been a catch all has been, um, you know, has been credited for things that he didn't do, for things that never happened, um, but also credited for harmful things that he might have not had a direct hand in. All that to say is that, you know, in order to come to a conclusion of whether Sarah needs to be in public space, first and foremost, we have to create an opportunity for those primarily affected and, and still continue to be um, those most Im impacted by, by the mission system to have a voice, to hear their perspectives, to hear their um, approaches and wants and visions for how they want to be um, not just engaged, but how they want to be memorialized within this, this idea of, of California and in here specifically Los Angeles. Because to me, it, it is an idea that is upheld by, um, by white supremacy, by capitalism, by patriarchy, um, and until we can have a, you know, a real dialogue about the authentic history of these places, of where we live, um, we're not going to come to any real understanding or any real solutions to live alongside one another. And when Indigenous folks say, like, land back, like, you know, it isn't to say that we want these territories back and we're going to kick people off, but rather we approach this in the same way that we approach our relationship to what we call nature. You know, the, the better we take care of it, the better, the better we all off are. Um, so I, I'll leave you with that. And I'm, uh, um, you know, with that thought, and I'll check in some of the questions here. Um, yeah, in, in regards to LMU and, and how some of the donors have really pushed for, um, 
having Sarah present, very much present in, in, in on campus. Um, I think, you know, the best ways to address these issues are sometimes through creative action. Um, the idea of removing a statue at Olvera Street and having the conversation turn from not putting the statue back up, but for the city to, to try and, and finally, finally um, come to terms with, with the displacement of the Tongva, the Tataviam, and to consider returning some land to, to those communities. I think that's a beautiful way of, of like that's a, you know, that's a beautiful thing that's happening to have a removal of a statue transform into that type of conversation. So how can you use art on LMU to address the issue of, of, of racist practices on campus beyond, beyond Sarah, beyond um, this one entity that, um, you know, for some doesn't, don't carry any value. I was, I think the first time I used art um, as a form of activism, I was probably 16, you know, around the time that, um, was it Prop 187? Or there was a proposition while I was in high, in high school that, um, that um, would allow for the state to try youth as adults. So that was probably the first time. Um, and it was involved with the, you know, with the punk rock scene and, and a lot of um, folks who were involved in that scene protested and had multiple shows around, around LA to, um, you know, to raise awareness around this issue. Um, if you're just starting to engage with, you know, this idea of artivism or just, you know, um, using art in this, in this, in this way to initiate social change. Um, have more conversations around what the change that you're pushing for is, rather than moving from, from your perception of what it can be. Um, because, you know, sometimes creating awareness around an issue might be also silencing those most impacted by, by the issue. So first and foremost, I would say, you know, do your due diligence in, in reaching out to as many folks as possible who are impacted by them and see how they wanna move forward. You know, if you're a male ally wanting to address issues of sexual assault, um, talk to folks who've been impacted by that first to see that the art that you create is reflective of what they're, um, you know, what they're hoping for. And let me see, last question before I hand this over back to Karen. As a German historian, I want to teach us about public history. I'm interested in hearing more about your dialogue and work with the Vendi Museum and German institutions, how you're just... So um, I'll also send a link to a series of dialogues that were put together with the Goethe Institute um, in this project called Shaping the Past. From my visit to Berlin, oh, last year, um, there was this real interest in, in bringing some of these indigenous frameworks to, to this, to the same conversations that's happening in Germany, you know, um, so I can share that and you can, you know, there's three, there's three, uh, three different dialogues there. And there's also one, um, called counter memories, um, with, you know, in partnership with the Thomas Mann house, that's really, um, that I feel is like really, really poignant. Um, so. Thank you all. Um, this has been a pleasure and, you know, turn it over back to Karen. Hi, Joel. Well, we can be together for a moment. There's a question in the Q&A that is, um, it says, Joel, highlighting authentic histories is powerful. Contestation and revisionist work are crucial. Do you have any thoughts on an authentic present? Hmm. Lorenzo, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know what? Um, that's what we're trying to get to. Like, I think until we have these conversations, like, you know, do we have an authentic present? Probably not. 
because there's so much there's so much that is that is hidden behind um you know these you know what we project onto ideas of of what america is or what the us is in one of these conversations um around american memory is like where does that timeline begin and end mm -hmm. you know do do we consider just just because we're calling at this point in time this area this landmass america do we not include what took place before um you know first contact do we include do we continue you know do we can do we continue marking time based on the impact of humans on a, on a specific area so i think it, it pushes us to reconsider how how um we center humans in this conversation rather than center like the whole ecosystem in the conversation um you know, the Tongva community here, one of the elders, Craig Torres, shares that, you know, when, you know, in some of the writings that when Spanish first in, encountered his people, they didn't consider them humans. Um, and, you know, he likes to flip it and be like, I take that as a point of honor because that means that we were so in tune with nature that they didn't recognize themselves as humans anymore. And that to me just like blew my mind when I first heard it. I'm like, damn, that is so true. You know, if you just, you know, come at it from the other perspective of like, are we still in line with what we consider to be, you know, humane and, and humanity? Or how or how have we also lost that through, you know, these ideas of capitalism and and um you know maintaining this <laughs> this construct of the US. And we've seen that with this, you know, issue around COVID-19. Um, that isn't so, you know, that isn't so, and that sucks. In one of the articles that um, you were interviewed for, you you described almost like a new ethics of monuments about how how it, it seemed nature could, in a sense, take its course. Right? Could you talk a little bit about that too? I I found that to be for me kind of a profound moment to think about. Yeah. So in conversation with with many um, Tongva elders around. You know, specifically when the Columbus statue was removed, um, elected officials already had an idea of what they wanted to do there, and you know they were engaging with with certain folks that, although meant well, it replicated the same imposition. We'll just replace a a, a human figure with another human figure, and they didn't consider at all what the cosmology for the Tongva community is. And in, in, in those conversations, the, the idea of oak trees and trees being the best monument that we could have here in Los Angeles, that's where, that's where it comes from. Previous to that, there was the Aliso uh, a sycamore tree in, in, in the area of Olvera that was used as a space for convening people. You know, what happened there, what, what you know, conversations took place, revolved around everything from, you know, I guess governance to, you know, um, cultural practices. And the idea of oak trees, you know, if you study oak trees, you, you understand that there's a whole ecosystem that is built by the presence of an oak tree, how it feeds all these other beings, right, from squirrels to fungi, um, and all of that in between, and, and how they even are interconnected with one another. One year, one oak tree will, will, will drop acorns, and you know, next year's someone else's turn. And this is all communicated within, you know, within the network of trees. So they even have a better sense to this idea of like what we call mutual aid and, and care for one another. Um, and so tapping into that, tapping into how you know other life forms can inform what we value, I think is really important. What would it mean for the birds and 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 other four-legged beings? to come back to the area of Grand Park that were there before the city of LA. Wouldn't that be like the best monument that we could have for this city? That we can still build out, be here, but at the same time, help bring back some of these things that we've, we've displaced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I often thought this way when I would be a commuter from the Inland Empire into LA and how the natural landscape would be transformed practically every month by a new housing development or a new 
uh, shopping center and how can that ever be reversed in a sense? Um, can I ask you, you've spoken so positively about your experiences and found things in every experience that have, have made um, you a stronger person, um, given you more insight. What are the most challenging aspects to the work that you do? Um, it, 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 I guess it's easy to get sucked into being like the central figure, to being able to, you know, um, yeah, as an artist to be then, you know, and we fall into these, these, these notions of like, well, he's an expert in this now. Um, or, you know, talk to that person because, you know, this is, this is what their work is around. So they're going to know. Um, I think that is one of the most difficult things to, to always remember to pause and be like, I don't have all the answers. I can, I can be that conduit. I can be that instigator um, to them bringing other people into the conversation. Um, I think that is one of the most difficult things to, to do as a creative person, because one, it's like there's a human tendency to like, one and, and be seen and receive accolades. And then there's that other institutional like pull that wants to create experts so that um, there's always a, a, a way out, you know? And we see that with like, you know, we see that with negotiations around the statues that want to be, you know, folks who want to replace it or put these statues back up where they latch onto one individual who's willing to say like, well, I see no harm in, in the statue being present but yet we're not doing our due diligence and having the very difficult conversations with multiple folks, even when those perspectives don't align. I think in, in that in-between, we find what it is that we all want. And in that conversation with, with Father Tom from, from the archdiocese and then these, these California or LA County um, Indian elders was that it wasn't whether we, in, we were in opposition of Sarah as, a, as an individual, um, and what he thought he was, you know, doing, and 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 the good that he was doing, right, as a as an institution of like of the church, um, but rather that because we were so attached to the individual, we weren't willing to talk about how people were hurt, and how even though intentions were good, people were still hurt, and people died, and we have to do something about that. Um, so. I let I walked into that conversation being like I have no no business being here, um, but you know there were also um, I would say um, gracious enough to be like well we want your perspective in this I'm like okay well then I'll share what I know and I'll share what I've, the conversation I've had with others not my perspective but my community's perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm grateful to you for sharing your perspective and for you know, taking us from your, um, your, your impressions of growing up in East LA and, and the forces that shaped your life and how you have really, um, I believe found the goodness in, in all these forces um, to promote change. I want to say that your website is um, rage1.com and you do many events and talks now during this, um, this COVID time. And I have had the privilege of kind of listening to you. And if people want to continue to hear more and also to know about resources to either follow you on Instagram um, or to, to go to your website, I am thrilled to reunite in this space. And I thank you, um, for sharing so much uh, with us today. And I wanna thank everybody for their work behind the scenes, the team. And um, it's been a very strange semester, fall 2020, but I feel as though having the, um, the drive to reach out to learn more about how artists are shaping our lives and our communities um, is kind of the ballast to all the things that we haven't been able to do. So thank you for giving me this privilege to be um, hosting Kaleido LA Fall 2020. Um, 
there are many plans for spring 2021 for Kaleido that are in the works right now that will be publicized shortly. Thank you all. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.